<sighs> hey guys. Hey, I gotta be honest. Uh, I don't have a lot of um, energy for a real punchy or a funny intro. It was Thanksgiving this week. I threw my back out earlier, uh, but it's better now. It's fine. Thanks for asking. And, uh, you know, but, but I tell you what, I do have a lot of energy for, and that's high level D and D um, and been thinking a lot about it and, you know, wanting to uh, talk about it. So I really hope you enjoy the video. This episode is brought to you by Claim the Sky, the long-awaited superhero supplement for Cypher System by Monty Cook Games. Claim the Sky is a deep dive into all aspects of the superhero genre, offering you dozens of new character creation options, equipment, creatures, ciphers, expert advice, and more. It's even got a complete ready-to-use setting, so you can jump right into an action-packed game of astounding superheroics. And even if you're not playing the Cypher System, Claim the Sky has tons of stuff that's going to be useful for any game you're running, no matter the system, as long as it's super heroics. So grab a copy of Claim the Sky now at Monty Cook Games Web Store. Link in the comments and description. Hey everybody, welcome to WebDM. I'm Jim Davis. And, um, you know, we've been writing this uh, book, Weird Wastelands, and recently I've been working on the Tier 4 location for it. And it really kind of provided the impetus for the show, because um, it was like, you know, we want to include content for this part of the game in our book, and, um, you know, not a lot of official guidelines or whatever out there. And so I started doing a little research, like, you know, what's the state of the uh, discussion around high-level D&D? What are people saying about Tier 4? And, uh, of course, the first thing I came across was like, all right, um, you know, no official uh, support uh, for uh, high-level D&D coming out of the uh, official channels. Uh, but I was maybe, you know, think, thinking like people are doing their own thing, trying something new, playing the game at that level anyway. And, like, I was disheartened <laughs> by the, uh, you know, by what I found. It's like just conversation after conversation of people saying that the game was broken, unplayable, uh, that they couldn't manage it at those levels, that, you know, the PCs were were so powerful and, and, and had so many abilities that uh, it was tough to challenge them. And that like, you know, they, they just gave up. They weren't doing it. Uh, they felt like that their games had run out of steam or, or that it, uh, uh, you know, just wasn't possible. And that's like really disheartening because as we explained a few years ago in uh, our first video on high level D&D, sort of explain the cycle uh, that happens where, you know, whoever has Dungeons and Dragons, whatever, whoever the developers are and the designers like, you know, t send out a survey or whatever, you know, how's the game being played? What levels are, uh, you know, people reaching with their campaigns and the like? And then maybe it comes back that not, not as many people are playing to those levels for whatever reasons, right? Real life, game interests, whatever. And then the game doesn't provide official support for those levels, right? Right? And so there's no guidelines or anything to go on for the groups that do reach it to that level. And a lot of them might say like, oh, all right. And this cycle just keeps continuing, becomes self-perpetuating until, yeah, it really is the case that uh, the game isn't supported at high levels officially. And for a great many players and DMs, the game does break down that uh, the mechanics of it uh, don't seem to work. And gosh, it's just disheartening because <laughs> high level D&D is so amazing. And while there's all these potential issues with it, right? Like there's all sorts of things that can go wrong with the DM or the players or the system. And yet it is an amazing time. It, it, it's some of my most favorite moments of D&D come from this. And my personal experience with Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition is that it's probably the easiest edition to run high level games at. It runs pretty smoothly at that level. By the time you get to high levels, a lot of the kinks and sort of weirdness have worked themselves out. As a group, you know, you've probably figured out how to manage those rough spots and get through them and come to some sort of arrangement about uh, how you want to play the game. That's the way it was for me, right? When I'd run high level third edition, it really was a nightmare. It was just hours and hours of prep only to sit at the table and have all of it land like a wet blanket. It was terrible. 
but I didn't find that with 5th edition. In the two campaigns that I ran, we transitioned to those levels seamlessly from both a narrative perspective in terms of like what was at stake, what the players were doing, how they were driving the action, as well as like mechanically and from power perspective. There was this smooth transition of scale as we kept playing. That was for two campaigns. And they were early on in 5e, right? The game has developed and matured since then, but so have I. And even though I've had those two experiences with Rise of Tiamat uh, and Out of the Abyss and epic level games there, or tier four rather, were um, great, amazing, had a wonderful time. My experience as a player since then, playing tier four characters, has been that like <laughs> the play experience does not match the hype uh, that you see about online. And, and, and while you might read like, oh my gosh, there's, there's all of these capabilities that PCs uh, have at their power to just like, I don't know, play the game. Uh, it's never really clear what it is that, uh, sometimes, <laughs> you know, that's breaking down. From a player perspective, I never felt like I was going to break the game. In fact, many times I thought I would barely survive uh, the encounters. Um, now, many of these experiences are one shots or the like, uh, some fundraisers or charity events where you get to play like a 20th level character in a preset adventure, but like the play experience is still the same. The level of uh, interaction with the rules is still there. You still have to remember all of the stuff that your character has. I remember playing in, uh, in like Invasion from Planet of the Tarasks, and in the first encounter, first attack roll, my Aarakocra Ranger, that I was like gonna make the cheesiest <laughs> uh, flying archer to fight these Tarasks, was almost one shot. If they hadn't had a, uh, a potion of invulnerability on, they would have lost like their whole hit point pool in one attack. So I find like there's this disconnect between the way we're talking about high level D&D and what the play experience of it is. Because if you do enough digging, you do enough research, there's plenty of people out there playing high level fifth edition and having a blast with it. It runs fine and they have great times. And it's that that I kind of want to talk about. But before we get into it, if you want to support our show, get access to even more of what we do. We've got over 220 episodes of exclusive podcasts over on Patreon, plus ad-free audio of every single YouTube show. So if you want to support us, go over there and check it out. So story time's over. Now we get to the tips. And you guys know which one I'm starting with, because this is what it's always going to come down to and that's mindset. In order to really embrace high level D&D, you have to be able to like examine your expectations of the game, communicate those to the players, understand what the players want out of it. And essentially it all boils down to like taking your fun seriously. I've had the most success at high level D&D when I've played with groups who were committed to a time and place that they could play. And if they couldn't, they'd let you know. It took years to get there. And that was something that was a, a painful struggle in and of its own right. But once in place, it opened up the door for this level of play because we could trust that we are all here to play a game because this is what we want to do with our free time. And we're here for the long haul, however long it takes and there was less of a sense of rushing things or of like needing to get to the end. And so it was that mindset of like, we're here to have fun, but we're gonna be serious about that. We're gonna learn the rules. We're gonna play uh, as fairly and openly as we can. Let the dice fall where they may and not deal with all that uh, bullshit that can clog up other games where you're bickering about various rules or, or overly concerned about a certain aspect of the game instead of just like, relaxing about it, understanding that if you don't get it right this time, it's okay. And breathe a little because this is supposed to be an enjoyable experience. And if it's not, then it's time to like take a look at things. So there's a, a mindset issue of taking a, you know, your fun seriously and thinking about the long game. <clears throat> tip number two. <laughs> it's tip number two. D&D is fractal in its embrace of adventure. In the crappy little mud thatched hut tavern where there's giant rats terrorizing the local peasantry, that's D&D. 
when you're on a nested demi plane in the mind palace of a primordial goddess trying to uh, restore fractured whatever from some antediluvian event your characters couldn't possibly comprehend, that's also D and D. And so, no matter where you go, even down to like the molecular level of what elemental moats are doing, <laughs> there's D and D there. And I think when you approach the game of Dungeons and Dragons as if there is always an adventure around the corner. There is always something interesting that will happen. And no matter what scale or scope you're at, there is an adventure to be had. You'll find that there's a smooth pathway that leads from first to 20th level, and all of it is adventuresome. Now, I don't mean a arc of a campaign in this sense that you know you figure out who the bad guys are at level one and you're fighting them for the next 19 levels and the like but i am talking about like wherever your players go whatever they do there's some sort of plot to get involved in there's some sort of antagonist who's trying to do something that they can stop or there's something for them to do that someone else might not want them to and the setting will react in that way and so as you're building your campaign worlds and, and, and thinking about the kind of campaign you'd like to play, think about that conceptual framework of like, what would a tier four conflict look like with what I'm building? What kind of tier four threats and organizations and the like do you want in your game? How does, how does the cosmology of the whole place fit together? How does that interact with gods and magic and all of that? That's high level stuff that we don't usually recommend you start with when building a campaign. We really recommend you work from the bottom up. But if you keep all that high level stuff in mind and make sure that you're looking for those transitions of scale, those moments where the heroes go from you know, pissant mud adventurer to someone maybe worthy of being introduced to a noble, like that is where D&D steps it up. And this is expressed in the levels, this is expressed in the character's abilities, it's expressed somewhat in the DMG and the tiers, but it's like, at the meta level, it's expressed as your characters getting, or sorry, your players getting better at playing the game and you getting better at DMing for them. So it's important to kind of understand that you're always prepping for high level games because there's nothing in a high level game that you aren't also doing in the low level game. Number three. Practice improvisation, right? It's all well and good uh, in this uh, era of Dungeons and Dragons to talk about improv and DMing and the like. But what does that really mean for you in your group that you're running your game for? What kind of tools do you find yourself needing again and again and again because of the decisions that your players make, the things that they like to do? For myself and a lot of other DMs, a simple name list and some evocative details is all we need to bring an NPC to life. And then if that NPC sticks around, we'll flesh them out later. But you might find yourself needing to come up with locations, threats, plots, secrets, whatever, on the fly, without knowing that this is the direction your players are gonna go. And if you start practicing that at low level, <laughs> when they're, the player's ability to affect the game world is rather low, and you just start building those tools for yourself, cobbling together out of stuff you find online, old rule books, things you heard in a video, whatever, and create a tool that's useful for you that no one else can create but you because you're the only one that runs for this group, then by the time you get to high level, you will have laid the foundations for everything you need to continue that kind of adventure. Because at high level, players do have a, an incredible amount of tools that they can bring to bear to alter or change the course of the game. In fact, they set the pace and the course at that level because of what they can do. So you need to be able to keep up with it and keep up with their decisions without it becoming a huge mess, you know? For me, I like to keep things very simple. I don't stat it out, I don't give it a mechanic until it's absolutely necessary. I use keywords and descriptors to kind of keep track of the big ideas about things in my campaign. These are the big factions, threats, conflicts, and stuff like that. That'll be relevant later, but at the time that they're introduced, say early on in tier two, I don't really need to know much about them. I also keep the information accessible and manageable. And so I'm talking about like play sheets for my NPCs, session record sheets, cheat sheets for rules or combat or whatever, as well as things like what's going on in the larger campaign scale. Are there any sort of 
dice oracles that I'm using to keep things fresh and interesting? And is there a single house rules doc that I keep all the changes that we've made to the rule system in one place so that everybody knows where they are? Those are things that I do to keep the information manageable. Mostly it's all through freely available online tools uh, that I'm sure you're aware of. So I got one more thing to say. I wasn't quite done with uh, tip number three. I just uh, had to breathe and take a drink. Um, improvisation is a practice. I think there's a lot of talk around uh, improv and DMing where it's like, it's fun, it's theatrical, it's performative. But like, for me, I found that I became confident enough to just say yes to whatever wild plan the players proposed that seemed plausible and confident that I could run with it because I practiced it. I would create the tools that I needed for myself. I would use them outside of the table to see how quickly it took me to generate the content and ideas that I would need in the middle of a session. Most of the time, I created tools that were too cumbersome, too much, not enough, and use the, or uh, <laughs> rather not, not enough, the opposite, uh, and would use them in prep so that I would have them pre-made for myself at the table, but you might like something different. The point is, is that this is something to practice and to build the tools for yourself that you need, because no one else can do it. All right, number four, that's eight, this is four. It's gonna be hard to hear DMs. This is tough because at tier four, your characters can disrupt any fact about the setting that you put into play, right? Like, I, I don't think that we should buy too much uh, into the hype, but I don't want to get to 0.5 yet. But like, you need to be ready to kill your setting, to kill your darlings. It's not yours to begin with, and it isn't static. By the time the characters that in your game are at tier four, their ability to affect change in the world is considerable. And if you introduce something into the world, the likelihood that, that, the, you know, that it'll be affected or changed or something by the player's actions is pretty high. This is a feature of the game. This is the whole point of playing. But if there's something about your setting that you just absolutely love and don't want changed, and you're gonna feel yourself pushing back using those techniques uh, of, of maintaining the illusion to then create a railroad, Resist that urge and be ready to see your beloved darlings slain murderously, destroyed, warped into their unidentifiable forms, whatever it is. The truth of the matter is it's not your setting. It's the stage for the game, which is something that everyone creates together. Your con contribution to it is the setting, the background, the NPCs, the monsters, a, a lot. But it is not yours exclusively, because the minute you introduce it into play, it's the groups, it's a product of the game. And it's not supposed to be static. It's supposed to change, to be dynamic, that the, the ruler of this particular kingdom is not gonna live forever, right? Unless that's a particular plot that the uh, uh, game is caught up in. It's okay for things to change. It's okay for there to be catastrophes and disasters and countries to be wiped off the map. That's part of the fun of this level, is being able to do this, especially if these are the consequences of player-led actions. That is where the real juicy bits of tier four uh, lie. All right, number five, here we go. You gotta get off the tier four hype train, please. And it's, it, 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 the, the train is everywhere, okay? It starts in the DMG by describing uh, characters as having superheroic capabilities, which, in moments is certainly true, but like tier four characters are very mortal and in many ways very fragile. Um, you know, the, the, we're not talking like prior editions where it's, where it's possible to become like immune to whole categories and multiple categories of damage or status effects or, or things like that, right? Where, where you don't even have to worry about your hit points being lowered because like literally nothing can touch you or hurt you. Like there are certainly extreme cases in fifth edition. You can certainly like pump your AC up, get a bunch of hit points. Like the defenses are there, but there's nothing as absolute as there has been in prior editions of D&D. In many ways, fifth edition characters at this level are the weakest they have ever been in any edition of D&D. The spells are weaker, the magic items are weaker, they've got few of them they can use. Like, it's really toned down from prior editions. And so, you've gotta like, break that idea that high level D&D, that tier four D&D, always needs to be about this like, 
huge super super heroic threat, the fate of the world's at stake, the multiverse, whatever, that gets old. If you want to play continuously at this level, if you want to treat this part of the game like you treated other parts of it, not as a winding down towards some retirement or whatever, but just a continuation of the adventures of these heroic uh, individuals, then you've got to like introduce stakes that are, uh, you know, appropriate for high level d d but that don't like keep <laughs> hyping things up and raising the bar continuously so much that you can't, uh, you know, fuel that. Your imagination's gonna run out at some point and people are gonna get bored of saving the world. And this is where letting the players choose what they wanna do, what course of action they wanna take, what plots they wanna investigate and that kind of thing really can save you a lot of time and energy because then they get involved in a lot of personal stuff. The stakes are more intimate and less like life-threatening <laughs> for all existence in your, uh, in your setting, even though I just told you to kill it. So, you know, well, take that with a grain of salt. All right, number six, we're nearing the end and I'm afraid, well, honestly, you guys, I, I uh, wanna speak very clearly on this one because this is a, uh, an aspect of D&D and DMing that I think has entered the hobby and has had a positive impact. But I think there's been some unintended consequences of it that can affect high level D&D. And that is, you need to stop being a fan of the characters in the party. And I'll give everybody a chance to you know, catch your breath. I'm talking about the characters that the players made, right? I want you to root for the players all the time. I want you to root for their success. We're here for the enjoyment of this, uh, you know, communal activity that is, you know, utterly unique in what it is that we get to do and create during it. I am here for the players to have a great time. And I'm a fan of my game and the game we all play, right? All of it, the setting, the characters, the, get the, the actions, everything. But like, I'm not rooting for the characters to win. I'm not a fan of them because I don't want anything to get in the way of being a fair and open judge when I need to be. I consider the role of DM as one of a referee, someone who acts as an intermediary between this imaginary world and the players as characters within it. The DM needs to be fair. The DM needs to be able to portray the world accurately and judge player actions fairly and openly. And if I'm like, rooting for the characters to succeed if i'm like man i really hope you make it to that level this particular character and not hey player i hope you have an amazing D, &D experience then i find that it just it tinges how i run the game and i can see its influence in a lot of the kind of problems that might arise at this level you have to really go for the throat for some pcs you have to like really come at them and try to get them you know, and this starts well before level 17 or so for some types of D&D. In order to portray the villains at this level, you have to be willing to say, yeah, they want to see your characters ruined. They're going to do everything they can and they're superhuman geniuses with millennia of time. Get ready. Those are the kinds of stakes that you can have. But if you're rooting for the characters to succeed, it's hard to have that level of tension and to keep those level of stakes feeling real if the villain keeps whiffing or if you just continue to nudge dice in the player's favor because you don't want to see this particular character get put in a tight spot. This is why I think rolling in the open, being fair, being transparent with your rulings is so important. And one of those things where it's like, I love my players, whoever sits down at the table, I love the characters that they create, but I'm here for the game we're about to play. And if that means one of their characters fails or is knocked out, I have a lot of sympathy. I'll do what I can to make sure that that player can still be engaged, but I'm not gonna try to nudge things just to make sure that the characters succeed at what they're trying to do. Or get to do a bunch of stuff because of the rule of cool. Hey, I'm take a drink. All right. <clears throat> I've still got my drink in hand because I'm, I'm hyped up on the tier, on the tier four hype train. <clears throat> Level seven, it's the tip you've stuck all the, all, all the way through the video for, right? Okay, this, is be this better be the best one, right? 
you've got to level up your DM skills. Seriously. Like there are so many stories of DMs <laughs> who are trying to run games at this level that are clearly outmatched by their players in terms of their creative ability, their, their imagination, their ability to think on their feet, to be cunning, right? This isn't a judgment, right? Some people, this doesn't come easy. They don't have the time. There's lots that get in the way. Many times I am this DM, right? I am not up to the challenge, but the whole game of D&D &D is one of rising escalation across every aspect. Your characters rise in levels. Each time they get, <laughs> gain a level, they have more power to affect the game world, right? The game world pushes back harder and harder. The threats rise, the scope increases. And for a lot of DMs, it, it reaches a point where their ability to conceptualize what that scope is and how to build conflicts within it, how to create tension, how to create an adventure, like escapes them. It, it, it's easy to think like low level, right? Like it's easy to challenge a low level party. It's easy to prepare an adventure for them, but it's much harder to do that for a tier four party. And I think like being able to, to, to look at yourself as a DM and honestly evaluate how you do from your own criteria, from the feedback you get from your players, from talking to other people online and to say like, this is the areas that I can improve. These are the areas that I'm, I'm good at. I should, you know, lean into those. These are the areas that I, I, I know I'm never going to improve. I, I have no interest in and clearly communicate that to the players, that that's not a part of the game that, that uh, you're interested in developing. Because I think that it's imperative on us as DMs to continue to improve our skills. And this is not a place you reach and then get to stop and say, fine, right? It's like a practice, a life, a lifestyle almost, right? Because you are picking up the, just the, the variety of, of ways of both describing an imaginary environment, being able to listen to other people, being able to handle and mediate conflicts, being able to imagine devious and complex situations and obstacles and challenges. Those all activate different parts of our brain, different parts of our skill set. but there is a way to improve them, right? And we have to accept that we do need to improve them. The players are doing the same thing. Their characters are doing the same thing. And in order to have a satisfying game of high level D&D, the DM needs to do the same thing. To me, that starts with imagination fuel. It starts with understanding the, the ways that the scope and scale of conflicts can change and how you can embrace that fractal nature of adventure to say like, yeah, you guys want to run some like low level in the dirt D&D or do you guys want to run some plane hopping, <laughs> tripping balls, cosmic D&D? I can do both, you know? And once you've accepted that, that you're going to improve your skills, the game escalates across all levels, then you can really rise to the challenge and have that game of high level D&D without feeling like it's getting out of control or that it's getting stale and boring. This is the end. I hope that the uh, seven tips helped. Obviously, there is a world of uh, topics out here that we could talk about. We didn't even really touch on combat and ways to, uh, you know, modify monsters and run your combats to challenge those characters. But that's, you know, comes with the territory beyond the scope of this video to get in that much detail. But if you want a, a more uh, longer form rambly talk, check out WebDM Talks on all podcasting apps. If you like the video, like, subscribe, ring the bell, and help us appease that great algorithm that rules all of our lives. And if you haven't yet, you can pre-order our book now over on Backer Kit. We're hard at work finishing writing it up right now. Link in the description. It's, I'm like, I, it, does, it makes noise. Yes, I know. I also have a rustly vest. You remember that Mitchell and Webb sketch where it's like the battle of Britain in the skies. But I, that's what I'm like. And I may have to have my whole self strapped down and I do the rest of the show like this. We'd like to give tips and mindset behavior for high level D and D everyone. Number one, mindset, taking your fun seriously. Now we look like a YouTube <laughs> 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 Exactly. <laughs>